You'd think this thing called the Right to Farm Act would make sense for a headline, but past that, not so sure. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Yeah, if somebody said, hey, do you uh, support the Right to Farm Act? You'd think, okay, well, farmers have a right to do business and to farm. So, yeah, but it's never that simple. Uh, and tonight we'll talk to an activist out of South Kingstown who wants to make that point. It's the second time this has come up on a television show in the last week or so. Um, and it's kind of an interesting little political uh, dilemma. Nice to have you aboard. Thanks for tuning in on this Monday evening. Picture perfect weather as we begin the summer, 4th of July. Everybody's getting ready. Everybody's in the mood. Let's check in on the rundown real quick and deflate everybody's mood. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, with what uh, Lexi calls Trump dates. It's an update on the, on the president. And actually, some would say he's gained some ground. Headline here with the Supreme Court. And here's CBS take on it. The Supreme Court adjourned for the summer, but not before it handed a victory to President Donald Trump. The high court announced it will review the president's travel ban on citizens from six Muslim-majority countries, and it allows the Trump administration to mostly enforce the president's executive order while the legal battle continues. The court would only have granted this stay, would only have allowed the, most of the travel ban to uh, go in place if it thinks that at this point, without full briefing and argument, that the government is likely to succeed. The 90-day ban would apply to citizens of Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Those people will not be allowed to come into the United States unless they have a credible claim of a bona fide relationship with a person or entity in the United States. The Trump administration said the travel ban was needed during an internal review of the screening process for people from those countries. The travel ban sparked massive protests and lawsuits, all of which the Trump administration lost until now. The court said it will hear arguments in the case in October when it reconvenes. You know, I have to tell you, if this kind of language was inserted in the beginning, the, uh, the local courts, meaning the local federal courts, might have had a harder time stopping it, right? Uh, you remember Kamad, Kamad uh, Amalaji, right? Khalid Amalaji. Khalid. Um, Khalid. Easy for you to say. Khal Khalid Amalaji, the Syrian doctor who uh, was at Brown studying, who went home and then couldn't get a visa to come back here. Uh, whatever the politics were behind that, if he had a chance to be able to say, hey, listen, I'm studying at Brown right now, that would qualify under what the Supreme Court is saying. Uh, this is more than just a token effort by the Supreme Court to, to, to try to find some common ground. It's an instrumental point and probably changes the way people feel about the entire thing. Now, strangers coming to um, America with a 90-day ban, I, I think most folks, for security reasons, would understand that that's something that you may want to, you may want to review. But if you've got a substantial relationship, I think that probably eases a lot of people's concerns. Uh, we'll talk more about that over the course of the summer, but the Supreme, now that the Supreme Court has taken a little bit of a rest. Uh, so I'm sure Donald Trump will call this all sorts of success, but the truth of the matter is, is that if they wrote it right the first time, they might have had so, so much stress over the thing. I guess that's my point. All right. Can I just mention this? This is going to be one of these things where the General Assembly is going to try to slide this sucker by, and if they do, we got big problems. This uh, op-ed piece in the journal is absolutely correct. We've had a lot of uh, quiet from the labor unions recently. They haven't done too much, and the General Assembly hasn't paid a whole lot of attention to them. But percolating right now is a bill which allows for existing contracts for public employee unions, police, fire, teachers, uh, that kind of thing, to extend at the exact terms that are in the contract until such time as a new contract is written. So you're saying, well, what's the big deal there? Well, right now, when a contract ends, you know, local community has management rights to be able to, to do some things that they may want to do. They may want to shave the numbers up or down. They may want to uh, add employees or subtract. There's all sorts of things that are written into contracts. And by the way, there are a lot of work condition issues that are written into these employment contracts that have nothing to do with compensation. Those things are important as well. But if there's a mandate that while you're negotiating a new contract that you just keep the terms of the existing contract 
and if the existing contract is palatable to the union, what is the motive the union has to actually come to the table and negotiate? So mayors and town councilors and administrators are starting to really feel a little bit of the freak coming on here because they feel like they're going to lose control of their fiduciary custody and responsibility of the towns and cities budgets. Uh, look this week for a lot of mayors and administrators and the League of Cities and Towns to make a lot of noise about this and I'm sure we'll tackle it a little bit later on this week. My point here is, is let your legislators know that you do not want this. You do not want this. Okay? All right. Uh, my guest may have a point of view on that. He was a town councilor for 14 years in South County, but uh, in South Kingstown. But we're going to talk about something else, including this. And this is why he's a guest on this program. Um, this is a gentleman who wrote uh, an op-ed piece to uh, speak against the Right to Farm Act, which I think has got everybody confused. What, you know what you do in order to pass something, you call it something else that kind of flips everybody's, I don't know, understanding of the thing, and it gives you a little bit of a foot up. Um, Jim O'Neill is a former South Kingstown town councilor. 14 years, right? 14 years, 2000, 2014. Well, that's a long run. And now you would call yourself a political activist who's kind of on this farm issue. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank the you, Right to Farm Act. Why can't people just farm? Jim, what's the big deal? <laughs> well, let's see. I think I've got a lot of background on this. I've, uh, the O'Neill family um, had 150 years of dairy farming in Vermont from uh, 1817 to 1964, so I understand farming. And the confusion is, uh, with the people out there who think nothing but good things about agriculture, which we have, up there have where? to improve. Up there where? Everywhere in the state. We love agriculture, we love farming. Mm -hmm. What we didn't realize is that this act, recently put in by a uh, representative, uh, the Right to Farm Act could probably be called uh, the Rhode Island uh, Right to Have Weddings. Anywhere, at any time, and in any zone. What? So what this the hell are you talking is, about? This is like corporate welfare for a few very wealthy individuals in the state of Rhode Island. Um, you read in the newspaper recently about seconded vineyards uh, from uh, um, a Forbes magazine recognized billionaire with the owner, a very wealthy developer in, um, in Exeter who lost his court case at the Superior Court because weddings and secondary events were not considered agriculture and many other cities and towns right now are just baffled as to what is happening because what this act does is change a farm into a commercial enterprise therefore what happens to zoning are you still residential do you know if your neighbor's going to turn it into a farm or not turn it into a farm this may involve uh, the Constitution. This certainly is going to uh, begin a war amongst neighbors because when the local towns, as this, ma uh, as this new um, legislation proposes, this act would preempt and bypass all councils, planning boards, and zoning. It would permit by right no local municipality could stop this act taking a step further you get into how's your neighbor going to feel all of a sudden you live in a residential zone everybody's got a beautiful home all of a sudden on the weekend you hear the calypso playing what's going on we've got a wedding going on and remember to become a farm nowadays you just need to grow a few tomato plants some dahlias from your wife's garden all right maybe so have a chicken farm. Is, but anyway but so the, point I, I, is, the reason wedding. i let you go on is because it, it requires that kind of um, background. Let's, a couple definitions. A farm in Rhode Island is defined as what? Farm in Rhode Island is, divi uh, is defined is, as what? Is defined as what you might think from dairy, animals, horticulture, aquaculture, you name it. The issue is... And how much product and or animal product or uh, to your point, how many tomatoes do you have to have planted in order for your farm to be defined as a farm? It just has to be your primary income. From your that primary piece of, income. From that piece of land. I the see. 1040F, you filed the IRS, which is included in your 1040. That is gotcha. your business from that farm. Doesn't require specific acreage? With this act, none. You could do it on your lot. Half no, no, no. I'm talking about farms in general. For, for tax and, and for legal purposes to be called a farm, 
acreage doesn't matter, just as long as the land use is, is your primary your source income. of income. That's All right, when we come back, we'll kind of lay out what's going on here. Are you getting a sense? You call it a farm, you do everything else, but stay with us. South Kingstown uh, activist, former counselor, Jim O'Neill is my guest. Just want to, we're talking about this Right to Farm Act, and it, it's, it's, it's hovering at the state legislature right now. Where is, the, where is it, by the way, in, in the hearing process? Do we know? Um, we're waiting to hear, and as you know, all the rules are suspended this time of year at the General Assembly. We do not have a Senate companion bill yet. So um, supposedly it was a work in progress. I don't know what that means. I'm, of course, frightened about that. Well, Representative Greg Constantino put this bill in on the House side, and we'll have to call Greg and see uh, and get him on here. We're on the radio weekdays 3 to 6 on WPR. Let's see if we can find out. I, on behalf, I think, of Kara Raffalian, who, of course, is the owner of Alex Nani and has her vineyard down there, um, does she, she likes to, she likes to, and she's in Tiverton, right, or Portsmouth? Uh, we're, we're, little Compton. In little Compton is, uh, with, with, with yeah. the vineyard. Um, she puts on shows? Or, or events? That She's had between uh, 25 and 75 events over the last few years. And uh, the events are? A majority of them, weddings. Weddings. Conferences, uh, festivals. Uh, gotcha. Uh, and the neighbors a, aren't that high on it? Uh, uh, high on no, it. it's just the constant noise, constant traffic, and it's in a residential zone. Okay, so was this legislation, do you think, because uh, I'm sure you've sniffed it all out, is the legislation designed for her, or is it? are you worried about others throughout the entire south county um planet down there you know doing farm business but you know using accessory uh language in this bill the right to farm and accessories meaning if you're using some of your farm grown products you know in the wedding what the heck you know it's like you know right i mean i'd be home right so i mean there's all sorts of ways to say, or you can run a big concert you know to celebrate the farm or that kind of thing clearly this is uh, this is a a response to some of the pushback that the locals have had there, right? So I haven't talked to anybody else, though, that supports this bill. I mean, the, the, the local communities, I don't think, want to lose the control uh, of people who are, quote, farming on their land and switch pitching their business model. That's correct. Absolutely correct. It's, it's pitching a different business model. Was this act put in on her behalf or this developer in Exeter who lost a superior court case and turned around, maybe couldn't win in court, but had a friend at the legislature, so put it forward that way. Mm. Uh, the issue is, in residential zones, uh, what's going to start happening with your neighbors? There are so much acreage, especially in the southern part of Rhode Island, that anyone can become a farmer. And the way the act reads, you, you can mow, mow a lawn, get some hay, as I said, a tomato plant, and all of a sudden you're a farmer. If then you, the weddings come in. If, this is the if issue you can, okay, so if you can declare, again, that the definition of the farm is, to, is, is based on your primary income, that ain't going to come from a single tomato plant. But if you can accessorize your farm, accessorize your farming with other events by law, then all of a sudden the primary income is a broader definition. Absolutely right. I see. Okay. And the Farm Act since 1982 was meant to help farmers, including new accessory events, corn mazes, tours, petting zoos, you name it. Um, and it had in there mixed use for possible special events. But the word weddings and conferences were never used. All of a sudden, this act that comes in now, they talk about weddings. Weddings. You, unbelievable how expensive they are. So you're going to have the tail now wagging the dog. Weddings they want to become the primary farm business. This is incredible. This is what I mean. This, this, could, this is going to be a zoning and constitutional crisis. This is what's happened ever since the Superior Court ruled on the uh, Exeter case. Well, I believe Greg has, who's I think a pretty fair-minded guy in a lot of ways, uh, I, I think he has said uh, in published reports, after all this pushback, that he considers this to be a conversation starter. Uh, and, and well, okay, that, so I'm not so sure, well, I'm certain that without your kind of activism and opposition, which, um, it, which is around the state on a pretty heavy level, um, this is the kind of thing that could have slipped through 
pretty pretty easily. But now that there's been a lot of noise, he's at least saying, all right, well, this is something we need to talk about. So you may have already developed the momentum to kind of slow this sucker down. I certainly hope so. I, I have in here for you the, uh, we have nine cities and towns now that as soon as they looked at this over the last month, they have all written resolutions to General Assembly members. Well, certainly because their zoning rights are being taken away. Totally taken away. Yeah. But <laughs> it's, we're ready for a conversation, but this has to happen away from the General Assembly. We have to get farmers and the Farm Bureau and DEM out there and neighbors mm. to put together what is a fair act. What is primary income farmer versus a gentleman farmer, very wealthy, who are out on their yacht and getting a $10,000 check to enjoy their beautiful piece of property? And the other thing you have to Oh, oh slow down, because <laughs> that's, an, that's an interesting angle. So what you're saying is you own the property, and by renting the property for another non-tomato growing or corn stalk growing or cow milking use, you can still get away with calling it farming because the source of income for is for the property, but it's doing something else. Exactly right. Ah, exactly right. It's so that's the syndrome. We got a lot of what we call them flatlanders flat that are landers. that are that are coming <laughs> up here and using exactly. the land and uh, you know out there partying in Newport while someone's running a, a mini concert or or a festival on their property. I guess absolutely. And and what I told you, I was a sixth generation descendant of uh, dairy farmers. Farmers. Real farmers are 24-7. Oh, they nonstop. never get off the land. I remember my grandfather talking about his father. His first vacation was when he died. <laughs> this is serious. This is not a wealthy individual who has a selected friend in the, in the legislature to put you got Lexi, this act. You, you got Lexi on that one. Oh. Did, you hear, did you hear the giggle on that one? <laughs> but it's true. Listen, <laughs> my, my in-laws are all from Vermont. Where in Vermont, by the way? Was the well, just family. north of Middlebury. Just, well, they, they were in Virginia. All right. All right, I love Virginia. <laughs> right? You know, Route 7, Route 22A, right High up there. Spriggs, all the way to Montreal. There you go. Say, <laughs> Jim and I are going to go get a beer and talk about that, all right? But, the, the, you know, the, the, all you got to do is take it right up 22A, and you see... The most gorgeous rolling hills. You'd think you're in Ireland, but the truth of the matter, Vermont farms are all over the place. You know that. But this is my this is my scene. I drive up a couple times a year, and I always ask the people that I've met up there. You know, what's it like? And it's a constant 24/7 economic battle. It's the hardest work in the world, and it is certainly not selling off the property yep. for other purposes. Exactly. And I think everybody who you asked about farming would know that definition versus the definition that is kind of what corrupting this, right? Yeah, they've just taken the accessory uses here to an excess. Weddings are not farmers. And these guys that own these beautiful properties, and mind you, they've done wonderful things for the state. But this is really very selfish for a very few. It's like, it's like corporate individual welfare for a few families to take advantage of this. But the unattended consequences are going to be what we have now had in the last few years, the most incredible legal battles. Hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent because I thought I bought in a residential neighborhood mm -hmm. and now I've got Galipso and rock and roll next door. So what happens now if a bank goes to lend on the property now? And next door has been granted by right, which means forever, seven events, 13 events, Little Compton, 48 events, uh, now 28 with the most recent one. This doesn't end. You're jammed up. You're jammed this up. This doesn't this. end. All right. Um, so you're asking people to, to write their reps and senators about this, I'm guessing? Yes. Or call them or, or stand on your head decision, and scream no? Yeah, this decision could happen tonight, could happen tomorrow. And like you pointed out earlier on the show, a lot of these decisions are going to be made the next few days in the House yes. and the Senate. All right. So uh, get after it. Since Jim's got some experience, I'll ask him about that uh, evergreen contract situation. 14 years on a council, he probably has an opinion or two on that. We'll be right back. Jim, I had one more point to make on uh, the Right to Farm Act, uh, this concept of cannibalization, in your, in your words or somebody else's words? Uh, my words, but uh, it, it's quite accurate. And if I just may for a minute, um, I've been a strong supporter of the governor's work and the General Assembly's work with the Commerce Corporation to uh, build Rhode Island's economy, grow jobs. This act, this Right to Farm Act, when you look at all, I believe the last number was 200 million of incentives that could lead to a billion dollars of construction investment in Rhode Island. 
Some of the major part of that are new hotels and rooms for conferences and weddings. And I brought you a Providence Business News article showing the importance, the value of weddings in Rhode Island. Basically, these wealthy farmers are taking these weddings and conference events away from huge debt that these investor builders and owners are putting towards this growth of our economy. We basically are eating our young here. This is incredible. And why would you do this for a wealthy few when there's such a huge investment in the state of Rhode Island? All right. And so again, it's uh, one more anecdotal reason for you to uh, to, to argue against the uh, the Right to Farm Act. Seems to make sense to me to to oppose this bill. Uh, we'll check in with Greg Costantino, the original sponsor of this, uh, of her further conversation on it. In the meantime, uh, you got a thought about this uh, evergreen contract situation? You sat on the council for 14 years. Yes. Uh, if you took you take local government's uh, ability to you know, manage finances away by mandating existing terms in a contract to go in perpetuity. Where's the, where's the negotiation crystal, right? No, exactly. And, and that was the important part, taking away management rights. But I must tell you, outside of the 36, remember, we have a couple of regional school committees. So let's say 35 of 36, 36 of 37, that I was on the town council a few years back. All but one, we were unanimously against evergreen contract being stated. Unanimous, but one. And one of the major reasons why this bill, I believe, is going through now is that the state of Rhode Island has lost a school population. We were about 172, 173,000 kids. We're down close to 140,000 kids now. So you've got contracts in place that were at these higher population levels. And mandatory staffing issues, all those staffing, kind of things. Staffing, what buildings right. to close, uh, you know, Warwick's been through high school, junior high combinations. It's phenomenal. So a lot of these um, uh, potential ball budgets could be based upon prior classroom size, prior budgets. And we have to look at this. And uh, uh, this is very, very expensive. But again, it's management rights. And I certainly understand, you know, I understand the unions and, uh, you know, I, I understand that maybe the population will come back at some point in the future. But right now, uh, it is what it is, and uh, it, it's going to be very expensive, and it does take away management rights. Yeah, I just don't know uh, what the incentive is for a union to, to aggressively in good faith negotiate a contract if they like the current one well there's 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 no incentive to create another one i mean none zero nope. zilch nope. it's a dangerous financial formula and you got to get not only should you step up on the right to farm act and tell your reps and senators you don't see any rhyme or reason for that stand on your head on the evergreen contract situation too because that's a problem. Uh, keep us updated, all right? Okay, yeah. I didn't know if I had one more comment on it. Very quick. What do you got? Ten quick. seconds. Well, suppose the executives from Johnson & Johnson GE that the governor brought to Rhode Island. Can you imagine them living on beautiful home in East Greenwich? And a couple of weeks later, the Galypso and the rock and roll comes out through the wedding next door. It's like they... you got the slow drip of thoughts on the right to farm out. I think you made a good argument. Get out. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Final thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> This is how Jordan Spieth won the Travelers this weekend. Look at this. You know what? You know you're a good player. Obviously, he's a great player. But you know you're a good player when you're in the trap and you'd rather be in the trap than somewhere else. Most of us go, <gasps> I'm in the trap. When you enjoy the trap, you know you're good. little ditty for you. Good night. <laughs>